So everyone, let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We gather here tonight um, for our course on just the stories and the memories of the parish. And Lord Jesus, we just ask you to bless all of the families who have been here in the past, all of the families who are presently here worshiping. And we give you glory and praise. We pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so what I'm going to do, um, everybody, just to begin these stories, I wanted to show you all very briefly this, uh, this great photo. So this is... Um, these are our 1913 workers. Um, we have, it's just a, <laughs> it's a good photo. Uh, we have um, John McShane here on the right and so many other people too. Um, I like to just talk about the stories. This is gonna be a, a night of open sharing. So we have a lot of people set up to share some stories. Um, I'm going to defer first to Jimmy Stewart. Why am I deferring to Jimmy? Because he's the only one calling in on the phone and he can't see anything. So he's the blind candidate. He can hear you now. Are you there? Okay. All right. I'm here. We're going to begin this class on the memories and history of the parish with Jimmy Stewart because he has the luck of the Irish, because he's a happy guy and he has stories. So Jimmy, I want to just ask you too, what was it like growing up at St. Patrick's? Would you have preferred any other parish? I think it's the greatest parish in the world it's situated in the neighborhood, the greatest neighborhood of Schuylkill. There you go. Great okay. and glorious St. Patrick, great Roger country, the country of our fathers. That's what we're hoping for, that enthusiasm. Tell me about the May procession growing up. You remember that? Oh, I'll tell you about the May procession. Before the May procession, they had another procession, and I showed up in my white suit, my white shoes, shirt, and tie, but I had long pants, and all the other boys had long, short pants. And then I see the sister with a pair of scissors, and then, whoo, I said, I was like a little in shock. And uh, I says, uh, well, I probably didn't say it, but I, then she says, calm down. I'm not going to cut your pants off. <laughs> I said, okay. So she, uh, with safety pins, she folded this, the pants up to short pants. And she said, just for the morning and this afternoon at the May procession, you may have your pants down. <laughs> now, Jimmy, now, that, now that we're on the, the topic of wardrobe, tell us about you dressing up in green tuxedos for the St. Patrick's Parade. Come on. Oh, well, I started that organization. It was called SIS, Google Irish Society, 1975. In 1976, we won the best the Monsignor Riley Award, the best dressed in the parade. Wow. So I had them all dressed up in green tuxedo. The first year, anybody seen, they, they used to have those regular tuxedos, like party tuxedos, but never all green. So with green top hats, we marched down the street. Now, proud of where'd you get the green tuxedos? Let's be honest about it. Uh, I got to make a boochies. And that's an <laughs> Irish establishment? Oh, yeah. I, I, well, Ikabuchi, he had the contract for the AOHs all around Philadelphia. But he, so, he was an Italian tailor from South Philly, correct? Yes, he was. Southwest on the border there, yeah. Wow. Tell us, too, about what do you remember um, about all... You were an altar server the whole time, right? Oh, I was a proud older boy. Yes, I was. Uh, and um, we wore the, the white surplices with the black cassocks. But when the New Bottom Chapel Church... Open, we had red cassocks, and they, we thought they were cool. You know, hey, we've got a red cassock. So, uh, now, what do you uh, remember? You remember this relic, right? This St. Boniface relic down in the lower chapel. Uh, St. Boniface, I'm it was the saint's uh, body down there. Didn't you say it was back behind the altar? Well, uh, I don't remember that, Father. I, it's not. You remembered it last conversation we had, but we'll, we'll come back another time. Okay, yeah, maybe refresh my brain, yes. Well, give me this, too. What about, what about uh, you remember, of course, the priest most of your lifetime was Monsignor Valley, correct? Monsignor Valley. I'll tell you, when he got that title, we practiced for weeks 
in the small auditorium in St. Patrick's School. And it went like this. Welcome, Monsignor. Welcome, welcome. This is your invitation to your celebration. Welcome, Monsignor. Welcome, welcome. So uh, there was five of us in in school, and we would go home, and we would be like randomly singing. And my and my father says to my mother, "Stop the Mary, to drive me nuts." <laughs> there you go. Jimmy, a few more questions just for fun. What was it like growing up in that in the neighborhood, just being a boy there? Oh, I think it was. A, I was a proud uh, be, for being St. Patrick's uh, the school and older boy. I, it was just phenomenal, I, you know, to just walk around the streets. Every, hey, hey, Stu, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Now your nickname was Sheriff. When did you get the nickname Sheriff? Everybody had a nickname. I got the Sheriff. I was a police officer for 25 years, but be, well, in the meantime, uh, I made a few arrests in the neighborhood, and then everybody says, "Who's that?" And he said, "This is Sheriff." So this, the names hung on me for for like for 50 years now. Yeah. There you go. And you and your wife Patsy, you were married at St. Patrick's or no? No, we were married in Ireland. St. Mary's. St. Mary's in Lavi. Lavi. Up there in North Dutton, and you're up there. People have to pull you aside after the 8.30 mass to get the full story. Is that right? Okay. Hey, all right. Alive at 11. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Anything else to add? Patsy, what, I mean, you've married this guy for a long time. He's okay, right? Oh, yeah. I'll keep him. Okay. There you go. Well, thanks. Oh, my we just wanted to hear from you and whatever. Any, any final thing? Any fun story? Any memory? Go for it. The floor is yours. Yeah, I first started St. Patrick's. In, in September of 1951, I can't believe it was 69 years ago. Uh, but uh, I had fun there. I, I, I religiously loved the church, you know? Yeah. Well, we love you too. And uh, you and, and I'll give you another funny, Father. Please. Uh, I, I was going to church, and all of a sudden, somebody said, you know the Dominicans are coming, and I, I, I my head swiveled. I went, "What's that? Like an attack of, uh, on like the Alamo or something?" <laughs> <laughs> well, we're tr we're trying to be okay. We're trying to take care of you too. Now, you're, you're, you're a great order. You're you're you're, you're running a great parish up there. I, I, I thank you. Thanks, there, Jim. All right. Um, I want to just I want to just switch now to um, to what we're going to do here for the. Uh, where is this here, the, the desktop? I wanna do the, um, just some of the stories. I'm gonna alternate between, cause we're doing screen share between recorded things from parishioners that couldn't join us um, and those live. So here's a recorded thing too. Um, we're gonna talk to Glenn Johnson. Uh, we're, getting hey. the wild, we're getting the wild men out of the way first. Glenn was a firefighter. He grew up in the parish and he has stories to tell us. I interviewed him just a few days ago and here's Glenn's uh, contribution today all right glenn here's my first question i asked this to timmy mcsorley how does it feel to be the face of the parish these days the face of the parish <laughs> i'm just kidding no i'm just intimidating you all right th basically three or four questions first question would be this what about growing up here you said everybody in this neighborhood knew how to swim oh yeah definitely that I was like that. a thing yeah that wasn't like a thing. They had, well, I'll, I'll tell you, they had down the pool, O'Connor pool, they had boys' day, girls' day. So if it was girls' day, the boys would go over swimming down and swim in the river. All right. Well, the piers, I used to, I would, they would play hide and seek or whatever in the piers. So I'd be in the pier, and this one guy was running past and hit me. I went in the river. I said, I thought I was dying. I swam over and I climbed back up. But then after you were done swimming in the river, they would come back and the, the hydrant was on uh, right up by Callahan's, by the pool. They would turn that hydrant on so you could get under there and, and get the, all this gunk and stink and everything off. Because if you came home, your parents or your grandparents, they could, you were in the river. Oh, yeah. these, these guys, some of them were tough. Well, now, now let me give you this. You talk about a rivalry between altar boys and choir boys. Oh, yeah. Come on. That was that was after the 40 hours. And after the 40 hours... Not too much detail. The altar boys and the choir boys would meet on Rittenhouse Street 
right around the corner from the church, and they would fight. <laughs> and most of the time, the altar boys would always win because okay. there was a lot of more altar boys than choir boys. But what, what it, I mean, did start the fight, but what really was it when the toughest altar boy would fight the toughest choir boy. And they'd actually fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was just... St. Pat's also had... Uh, Jimmy Stewart told me that they would sometimes go to fight in Fittler Square. That was another sight. Oh, yeah. That's, what about that, sports teams? You see, what, St. Pat's had a track team. They had a baseball team. You ran track? Yes, I did. They, I'll tell you what, they had... Uh, I don't know who the guy was who came in as the coach or something. And uh, he... We had a, quite a few guys that uh, could run fast. And uh, they took us over to Penn, and we were going to run in the uh, the Olympics over there. So not the real Olympics, no. Whatever that Penn's Olympics. Yeah. yeah. Did you have uniforms to say like St. Patrick? I don't think so. <laughs> no. Uh, you you had a bar up the street. Yes. What was that called? That was it was McCoy's, and then I think it was uh, after McCoy's. Gavin's. It was Gavin's. Then you got Killeen's over on the... That was Killeen's. And then across the street from Killeen's, where there's new houses, it used to be the post. Like the American, American Legion. Legion. American now, Legion. Holy, you, you would say that... Because it's funny, we had huge abstinence societies of the Irish swearing off alcohol at our parish, but then you also had a lot of families that owned bars. That was like a neighborhood culture. Yeah. I can't... I. You know what John Wayne said? <laughs> John Wayne said, don't trust anybody that don't drink. <laughs> what about two hanging on corners? That's Yeah. That was a thing. That was a thing. You had, uh, maybe you'd have the uh, younger guys down 26 and south. You had the uh, older guys at uh, Callahan's and up here at Cabins. And, and a, lot of, a lot of guys you're saying joined the Marine. This is a big Marine Corps neighborhood. Yeah, quite a like few. That was, would, especially was Vietnam era. Yeah. A lot of guys went to the service. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I, I mean, when you graduated high school, you either, like I said, you get it, like you got a job. Uh, if your family could afford it, you went to college. And then the other guys, they just joined the service. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do it. I think it's awesome. The short version to of Uncle Tom McGee. That's an amazing story. Oh, Uncle Tom. Come on. Because that has to do with war. <laughs> okay. Real quick. All right, real fast. Uh, Bratsy's was... brother uh, was in the service, and uh, he uh, went to Vietnam on two tours. Well, the second, his second tour, we figured, ah, oh, he ain't coming back. So myself, Bobby McGee, and his brother Jimmy went down and went through his clothes. And uh, whatever fit, we took. So Georgie came back uh, from Vietnam, thank God, and uh, he was down there, and he he noticed half of his clothes were missing. So we asked, and of course, we were truthful with him. We said we didn't know. <laughs> and then uh, we're all in Callahan's, and Georgie looks out the door, and he sees Bobby's Uncle Tom coming down the street. And he says, Bobby, Bobby, come here. He said, Bobby, is that my Newman? jersey uh, is that my newman sweater and bobby said uh yeah uh, uncle tom really likes it and everything else. it's like He's, his letterman sweater yeah swim team varsity yeah, yeah. and then so uncle tom, uncle tom he georgie said you've got to get that for me well in the meantime uncle tom passes away and georgie says to him bobby get my sweater and bobby said george uh i got bad news for you he said uncle tom really loved that sweater so we buried him in it. There you go. <laughs> it's six sweaters, six feet under. <laughs> so you guys always behaved like that. Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. It, it, it joked around a lot. A lot. All the nicknames, who were the nicknames we were talking about? Onions, Quinn. Who's the, who's the guy that drove the bus? Dibbles. He lived over there. 24, 25. Dibble, your, Dibble McLaughlin. Your nickname growing up? Oogie. Oogie. <laughs> Fish, all kinds of things. Fish Connors, yeah. Uh, yeah they had, uh, all the guys, and the girls too, some of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had, yeah. You got it. This is the name 
of all the neighbors. It's got the address <laughs> and all the neighbors. So you've been keeping record of who's moved in. And I, I got copies of it. I'm going to round stick them in a mailbox. Really? Yeah. To try and make it into a neighborhood again. Yeah. Now you yeah. think they they value that, or they just? Oh yeah. Yeah, I know quite a few of them that they're going to say that we just had two new babies on the block. They'll say, "All right, no, you didn't have the baby." Hey, you're not name. the block captain. That's a Philadelphia thing, right? Block captains. Yeah, I'm not officially the block no, captain, but unofficially the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, everybody. Everybody can tell he's a saint, you know? So there you go. Um, I want to do another live thing. Can everybody hear that okay a little bit? Thumbs up. I know it's not the highest volume. Yeah. Right. Yep. So I want to go and play just a very brief clip right here from Alice Mary Lawler. Alice Mary Lawler was a long-term parishioner at Old St. Joseph's. Uh, it's just a few brief minutes. Uh, she she lived in St. Patrick's Parish, but she thought the preaching was bad, so she doing old St. Joseph's. Anyway, she started to come here for daily mass, though. Alice Mary is now 93. She's lovely. She's incredible. She eventually did become a parishioner here. And um, this is going to segue into Stephen Paisani, who's a St. Joseph's parishioner, too. I'm going to just talk to ask Stephen a few quick questions. But let's listen to Alice Mary for um, just uh, three, four minutes here. Here she is. I'm, she was on the phone here. So. so so, you were, I mean, around many years, you had done what, did you say, 25 years at Old St. Joseph's, the Jesuits? Yes. Because you yes. love the preaching there. Right. And again, not to make a comparison between the two parishes, but what would you, uh, what would you just describe the feel? I mean, what we're getting after two is what's the, what's your impression of St. Patrick's, you know, just compared to your other times of practice? Well, it was, a, it was a neighborhood church, and uh, I got to know a lot of people that were, you know, living in, in the same area. And one of the reasons I joined, I wasn't, I didn't join right away, uh, but I went there to daily mass, and one woman who was quite a character, uh, I can't remember her name, unfortunately, she said to me, why are you coming here? <laughs> She said, you belong to St. Joseph's. And I said, because they have daily mass here. <laughs> anyway, that's how I, and I felt I better join up. Yeah, and so we, 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 still get a lot of, we still get a lot of St. Joseph's parishioners. <laughs> yeah, now, looking really. back on the St. Patrick years, too, do you think, um, were they mostly routine and peaceful? Do you remember any sort of big events? How did they strike you looking back on the years? They, well, they had a wonderful group that did their Christmas party, and that drew everybody in. They didn't have much going for the kids, because most people were working types. Sure. Uh, there were a few kids that went there, and and I had a friend who I knew pretty well, and she taught religious instruction. But, uh, but it was one of the mothers that promoted that. Um, she has three kids and she wanted them instructed and so she started the thing. But, <clears throat> but the, it was mostly working people and, and then people who lived on the square, uh, sure. retirees. Uh, they had, and they, and they also had a big um, South American population. And I, and I also think they had a Korean mass there, didn't they, at one stage of the game? Mackel had that. Really? Korean mass? Yeah, Check I out. think it was... I record this. Does anybody remember this? Anyway, we could chip in later, but Alice Mary has these exotic memories, so I'm just... <laughs> it's more asking the question. Here we go. Yes. Or, but they certainly had... They certainly had this group that were going to, from, they had, from uh, South America to go to Penn. They're taking, they were in the Wharton School. This, this bunch yeah, we, the we still have a lot of uh, Wharton students from South America. Right, sure. absolutely. And uh, they live in the neighborhood, and it was perfect. And these people would meet outside of church, and they'd be racing along in their, <laughs> their uh, accents. It was wonderful to listen to them. They brought their kids you know, to church and so forth, but they hung out together. Yeah. And and, uh, and, and I think Mackle had a... a, a uh, a mass for them, and I know one of them asked Mackle to marry them, and they flew him over. They actually, he he, went, he was they, they sent him to Spain <laughs> to marry whoever it was. He got closer. Yeah, there you so, go. Yeah, he, he yeah. Well, I guess that's a pretty good impression right there. That'll give you some idea. Right. Oh. It, it, I, it was, I always 
like the church. I was, you know, it, it was easy for me to walk there. I only had four blocks to walk. And uh, people I found very welcoming. And after my husband died, I heard from a lot, an awful lot of people that I had gone to morning mass with, you know, uh, and I didn't even think they knew who I was. Sure. They had heard that. Really quite nice. And, uh, Anyway, so I want to introduce a segue. It's funny, Alice Mary, she, she knows a lot of the priests. Funny enough, she has this real backstory on the church out in Gladwin, St. John Vianney. Her family is very close as a girl. A lot of what the recording I got from her was there was this real wild priest who was, who was banished out to Gladwin, who eventually ran ranches, and he had racehorses, and he started the parish out there. So she has a whole story on that. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting because she's a St. Joseph parishioner for a long time that also came to daily mass here. We have another St. Joseph parishioner who comes to daily mass here, Stephen Pesani. And um, I wanted to introduce Stephen just for a few fun questions because he's been in the city the whole time. So Stephen, you can unmute yourself. Can you, can you hear us there? I can, thank you. So I, you, I want to ask you a few fun questions. You guys were forced to take the abstinence of alcohol pledge at what grade? Second. <laughs> it was part of confirmation. Okay, so give us give us the rundown. That that surprised. That me. was just part. I mean, you know, uh, I was one of the uh, rare ones, I guess, that we were um, on April thirtieth, nineteen sixty. We made our first communion in the morning, and we were confirmed in the afternoon. Because in those days, you you weren't confirmed during mass. It was just the celebration of the sacrament and then benediction and um so at some point within the ritual and i can't remember exactly when we had to stand up and take the pledge so until uh, what grade until when until we were 21. okay so from from second grade to 21 we had a promise that we wouldn't drink until we were what 21. was your grade school epiphany epiphany south yeah. billy what, would, what, would, what you've seen the church change in the last many years, just like all over these decades. Describe that briefly. I mean, it used to be a big deal. It's still beautiful, but not quite as big. What, Epiphany? No, the, the just the archdiocese most. Oh, the diocese itself. Well, I mean, it was, you know, in that book, um, American Catholic, it describes how the, when there was, the church was getting established in this country, the conscious decision was made to create an alternate universe. And so, and I was, I was born and raised in that, you know, where you could live a full and complete life and never leave the Catholic world. Hmm. Just like listening to Glenn, you know, you had the parish had all the various sports teams. My grandmother's parish in West Philly had a parish uh, savings and loan. Um, wow. Beneficial bank was founded by St. John Newman or he was involved in its founding. Of course, that's a little before my time. But um, so yeah, it was a, a complete Catholic world. I didn't, well, I did, you know, I really didn't become friends with any Protestants until we moved to the suburbs. Hmm. Um, the, the, the irony of it though, I was born in the early 50s in South Philly, or born in the city, and then I was a year old, we moved to South Philly. And the odds, I mean, think about this. We lived, it was a small street, 56 houses on the block, three non-Italian people on that block. Mm -hmm. And we lived between two of them. On the one side of us was a Jewish family, and the other side of us was a Protestant family. And the other Jewish family lived on the corner. So it was... Um, well, in my conversations with you, too, the, the students in school were taught a lot about the bishops, a lot about the church. Was that the case then? That it was. Well, and not only were you taught about it, we lived it. I mean, it was part of our daily experience. I was just thinking today, I remember very clearly on October 11th, 1962, at nine o'clock, every church bell in the city of Philadelphia rang to mark the opening of Vatican II. Wow. And I was in fifth, and we had to stop and say Pope John's prayer for the success of the council. I was in fifth grade at the time. Hmm. Um, 
our grade school, you know, our grade school had like 1900 kids in it. Um, my first grade classroom had 126 year olds in it. Wow. Um, our convent had at least 17 nuns in it. The parish yeah. directory had five priests in it. Now were you guys, were you, were you pocketed in South Philly, like your parish epiphany Nowadays, like our parish, St. Patrick's, we did a Lenten mission, our priest at Epiphany this past yes, year. Yes, yes, yes. And we knew of each other and this and that. Would you have ever heard of something as far away? What are we, three miles from Epiphany? Would you have ever heard of St. Patrick's as a kid or no? Um, I remember, I remember like when I was old enough to come into town by myself, it's so like maybe sixth or seventh grade, um, walking by St. Patrick's. And I was intrigued because there was a sign outside to the entrance to the lower church chapel of the apparitions mm. and i was curious to see what this was and i went down to open the door and it was locked so <laughs> it was much 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 later when i finally saw the chapel of the apparitions and now you're there most days at 7 30. yes yeah so um any other yeah. thoughts too before we because we're going to keep moving at a clip just about this diocese about just i mean Vivid moments in your Catholic history, yeah. Um, I, well, well we're so I know you think of childhood with, with the pretzel boy. You thinking of pretzels? You thinking of the, the Phillies? Yes, and the very much. I I, I yeah. grew up on pretzels. That was almost, especially in the summertime. Oh yeah. And um, I guess everything you know in school, we did everything was held together with bubble gum and spit. You know, it was. Um, you know, we needed two cents to make a nickel. And um, again, with like 17 nuns around, you know, we had very few lay teachers. What always impressed me, or when I look at situation now, our rectory had five priests in it. He had the, the pastor, um, the pastor, the senior curate, two other curates and a resident. So we had five priests in, in the rectory. Um, and Sunday masses, you know, the nine o'clock up, the nine o'clock down, you know, yeah. there was always two going on in the upper church and the lower church at the same time. And all the kids had to go to the nine o'clock mass in the upstairs church hmm. every Sunday. Yeah, that was a big thing here too, our nine o'clock children's mass. We're going to get into that. Stephen, quick thing too. Um, we have a chat from Jim McElwain. He was just asking, who wrote that book, American Catholic? Uh, Charles, Charles Moore, Moore, Morris. Okay. Charles Morris. Is he a Jesuit? Not sure. No, a layman. Okay. He's a layman. Well, listen, keep chipping in. We're going to keep the conversation rolling, but... Okay. I, Thank you. I want to play two from, um, from Joe and Dolores Walsh. Dolores is... Uh, she's, of course, here on the call, but I just had a fun recording with them a ways back. And um, it's just about their marriage. They've been here since birth, uh, at least mostly. So they grew up in the neighborhood. We're going to play quickly... Dolores and Joe. Dolores, where you grow? Here we go. Here. In, in this house. house. Yes, in this house. My dad raised, um, there were seven of us. Wow. And also his um, first cousin, my niece. Uh, my so, dad so, so you both grew up in the neighborhood? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you met at how old? I was uh, a junior in high school because uh, Martha, Joe's sister, wow. was friends with my sister, Jean. They were two years ahead of me. Do you me remember where you met? Where did you meet? Um, down in with Martha, yeah, with Martha, and then not um, at a bar, I hope. Oh, no, soda <laughs> shop. No, yeah, no. are you kidding? When I turned 21, my own brother wouldn't even serve me, he was wow. a bartender. And he really, was, where was he a bartender? Uh, well, he was a bartender over here at Teddy's at 23rd and Market. Okay, so you all met through a sister, you, you, you took eight years to get married because mm -hmm. of fear and trembling. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I just want to take care of my mom. Really? And even the day that we got engaged, back in uh, October of 72, Joe put the ring down on the coffee table and I pushed it back. <laughs> he pushed it over. I pushed it back. Really? And he said, don't worry, we'll take care of your mother. And I said, okay. <laughs> that was it. So you proposed in, the, in, your, in this house? In this house. Where? What? Right here. On the coffee table. On the coffee table. So you proposed in the room we're sitting in right now? Yep. That's amazing. And my dad? But, but I got the ring. Oh, you locked it in the car. I accidentally locked the car, the keys to the car. 
inside, and the ring's inside, and I'm in a zone that where they can tell. And, uh, they were tough back then. I had to tell Dolores, run down to my father's house to get the extra set of keys <laughs> and come back. Wow. She didn't know the room was in there. Sure. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So how many years married now? It was, we got married in 74. Right. So talk, 46. Yeah, before we talk parish stuff, what was that like at St. Patrick's School? Um, the nuns were strict. Uh, you went home for lunch. Right. Because they didn't serve lunch in, in the uh, school at all. Um, There's something about exiting through their convent. They would let you go through their convent. You, you could go through the convent. Um, my, our brother Frankie, um, well, we used to have to clean. Certain girls were picked to clean the convent. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Same with, same uh, with when I went to yeah. St. Anthony's, you would go, be picked to go over and help the nuns clean the wow. Joe Hattie Macklin Hart Nuns. Would they supervise you at recess or they let you run wild? Oh, uh, no. oh no. Oh no. You, um, strict. They were strict, and I can still see Sister Thomas Aquinas if you'd be in the upper church, especially to come around St. Patrick's Day. And she'd be banging her foot saying, pump it up. Because it's always sounded like a, a funeral song. What's that? Dude? The St. Patrick's hymn. Yeah. And always that and she would always say, Pump it up, pump, pump it up. up. You know, they had that. Yeah. It's not a funeral song. Yeah, this is what oh glorious Saint Patrick. Yeah. Father of our country. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can still remember her doing that. Yeah. Um, on Senior Valley. He was very uh he used to come over they used to have a children's mass and that was at nine o'clock on Sunday. Yeah. And you had your little envelopes to put a quarter in back then. And then every Monday he would come over to the school. And I think some kids would say, oh, please don't pick our class. Please. And he would come in and ask you what the gospel was about. Um, it was never harsh. Yeah. Never harsh to us. Um, but he would then, if he didn't know, then he would say, well, where were you? Yeah. <laughs> you know. But he, he was very good. He would really keep the pressure on you. Yes. He was from County Mayo. Well, did you did you see a difference? He used to go back also to Ireland every yes. summer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he? Could you tell he was an Irishman? Did you tell he did he, did he adapt to America? Um, I think he adapted. Um, I think he was part of St. Pat's. He was St. Pat's mm. to us. But St. Anthony's, what was that like in comparison? Would you say that was more down to earth? It was more working class. Working class for Irish. I mean, you had you had families down there like the McGees had how many? Seventeen. McGees. Seventeen McGees. Kids. Seventeen Hannons. Seven. Yeah. They're all good Irish families. Oh my God. <laughs> so like Joe said, growing up, if you fought one McGee, you fought them all. Yeah. Yeah. Fought them all. Like I, the girls. <laughs> Who's this? That's Joe with his dad. Wow, that's you. Yeah. You're pretty small. Yeah. <laughs> Dad was the nicest guy. Big. He was, your dad was big. Yeah, good man. As a teenager, it, it was called the uh, Commercial Museum out there, the Children's Hospital. And it would be a team of men who would raise these big granite blocks up by hand. Police and. Uh, and we built the convention center. It was coming out across from the. Uh, yeah. Really? And if yeah. you dropped one block, the whole team was fired. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did they tell you? Uh, what were their memories looking back? Like, what were some of the stories they'd say of the neighborhood or the church or the? Well, when they were growing up, you had that um, influenza, was it? Yeah, they were there for that. And yeah. they and Dad said they would feed the kids. What was it? They said coal oil. Coal oil, so that they wouldn't catch it. Mm. But they would come through the alleys with a big cart to take the bodies away. Any bodies today? Any bodies today? Yeah. Because back then you didn't go to a funeral parlor. You most of the people got laid out at home. Because I know when we were small, my mom would. That was still us. common when you were small. Yes. To the living room. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. They would bring them in through the window, because yeah. Grandpa yeah. McAvey was very here, or yeah. laid out here. Because mom said they came in the front door, paid their respects, and out the back, and out the back, and down out the alley. 
I'm going to interject here. You know, I had conversations with Dolores and Joe and all these people for, for over an hour, hour and a half. So I'm only taking small clips. Now that we're on the subject of death, I, I did catch Bill Logan, who is the fourth generation funeral director. Bill has about a minute long comment. It wasn't even too serious. Here's Bill Logan today. I just talked to him this evening. Your father was Undertaker how many years here or like in the area? Well, my, my great-grandfather started in 1895. Wow. Um, my grandfather would have been, like, from the 1920s on to, I guess, my dad probably took over in the, he got out of high school in 51, so he's probably, you know, from, like, 55 to five years ago. Yeah. Um, but my great-grandfather started it, and, um, like I said, we were more the funeral home of the Irish immigrants over by the South Street Bridge. Sure. Um, Schuylkill neighborhood. Now, one statement. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's been a good profession or no? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of dead. There you go. Good joke. <laughs> All right, I got to take off for this night say, class. I would say people have all, people in the neighborhood have been dying to meet us for over 120 wow. years. <laughs> That's, thanks for that. I'll, I'll touch base soon. Sorry, <laughs> That's Amazing. real for you. Ever, <laughs> ever sober. That's fun. So I wanted to show, uh, anyway, let's talk about more positive visits to the parish than just undertakers. Um, can I call on also Nancy Tobin, if you could unmute. You remember the priest visiting for the October block collection started 1925. Could you give us a little bit, Nancy, on uh, when priests would always visit in October, your home? Uh, it was a big occasion. It was something that you did extra house cleaning for. You might have refreshments available. And it's, uh, you know, it would be announced, you know, at church, which blocks would be covered during which time period. So everybody was on high alert. And uh oh, I didn't when, know that. When father would get to your neighborhood, word would go quickly through the neighborhood. He's coming, he's coming. And everybody would be ready for it. Dolores Walsh gave me one of those cards. You had to fill out a card ahead of time, right? Yes, you did. Sort of a census of who was living in your house and, you know, were they in school? Were they working? Just so that the parish office would have the right records on who was there. And he would visit. He would give a blessing. You would all kind of mm -hmm. kneel for the blessing. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. He would say, is there anything you'd like to talk to me about? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. And the one time Father John Fay got me. Um, I was, uh, I had finished high school and I was just about to start my first job because I was trying to earn money to go to college to become a teacher. And Father Fay found out and he said, boy, have I got a job for you, Nancy. And I said, you do, Father? He said, yes, we have CCD, the classes, the religion classes that we give to the children who are not attending parochial school you have to be our teacher. We have a gentleman who's a lawyer right now doing it, but he needs help. Huh. So we'll see you on Sunday. What year was that? Uh, 1978. Wow, and you're still yeah. teaching for us this year via Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> now, what, yeah. what was it to, um, give me to the basics on, you had said there was some sort of rosary meeting in people's houses for a while. Well, on my block, yeah. Um, when my mom moved into the neighborhood, she didn't grow up here. She came from West Oak Lane and she moved in with dad when they got married. And she wanted to carry on the tradition that was started during World War II. Uh, many blocks had rosaries to, to stop the war, mm. ask our ladies help. So she organized, you know, all our neighbors who were Catholic and they alternated every Monday night, a different person would host the rosary in their house and uh, it was attended mostly by women and their children. The guys didn't want too much to do with it. Uh, and then it would become a little social. They'd have refreshments afterwards. And that, was, that went on for a number of years. And in May, we used to have whoever's house was on a particular Monday night in May, we would have our own crowning of the Blessed Mother. Now, uh, Nancy, you're the Tobin family, there are a lot of Tobins. What's their reputation in the parish, the Tobins? Uh, I don't know what their reputation <laughs> is. 
Um, I know, I know my dad out of all of his siblings, he was very, he was kind of the shy loner one. Yeah. So, but, uh, but there's a lot of them. And I talked to your cousin, mm -hmm. Joe, who plays the bagpipes. Jimmy yeah. Stewart, you ever heard of the Tobins before, Jimmy? Oh yeah, Joe Tobin, best, best bagpiper around. There you go. Hi, they're Jimmy. Okay. <laughs> they're okay people in your book? I think so. He yeah. says yes. Um, Nancy, anything else? Like, what do you remember from all you grew, you spent your whole life here at the parish? Um, if, if somebody was not from St. If they'd never been to Philly, they say, well, what was the parish like you grew up in? How would you describe, I don't know, St. Patrick's off the cuff? Well, it, I'm not the best person to describe that because I did not go to the school here. Gotcha. Um, my mom, who was older when I was born, she said, I will have to walk six times a day to that school because we came home for, the children came home for lunch. And she said, I'm too old to be walking back and forth six times a day. So we're going to find you a school that has a bus. So I ended up going to St. Leonard's, but all of my friends went to St. Patrick's. So I would hear things through them and I, I would attend their May procession or what, whatever was going on. So I always felt kind of like the outsider who wanted to participate in all this, but I was a kid that didn't go to that school. So you would, you would go to Sunday mass where? Well, St. Patrick's, definitely. Yeah. But, but you weren't participating in those things exactly. But I wasn't with the school groups. I wasn't attending the I, mass. I was with my parents. And unless you were, you weren't really on the in crowd. Right. And Nancy, right. Through, through teaching our catechism, you're on the in crowd. Uh, finally. Yeah. It took me a lot of years. Well, that's right. um, thank you. And please chip in, too, and we have some questions and answers, too. I want to just show briefly... Um, I want to show here um, a few more things. Um, so one of my favorite, two of my, we're just going to go through two videos back to back and we're basically open session, whoever else. I want to show, so Rosemary Fitzpatrick, Rosemary is actually moving away from the parish. Um, she didn't grow up here, but she moved here for work. She would always come here as a child because her aunt lived here. So I, I got a small video of Rosemary this past week, even though she is moving away. And it's a great video. I'm going to play that before our last video. Two more videos is the official presentation of stories and then it'll kind of be open season here. Tell me too again briefly, you had moved from Philly to Ireland and then back. What was that for again? My father died. You were how old? I was two and a half to seven and a half. Five years I spent there. In County Derry. County Derry in Northern Ireland. In a mansion. <laughs> in a cottage with no running water, no plumbing, no electricity, but it was home. Now, what's the difference of the Irish there versus Irish immigrants here, culturally? What did you pick up on? Well, I, th I don't think it depends on which area the, in Ireland they came from, but I think the Irish were the same, but I think the fact that there were so many material advances here, I think that the Irish thought that they were more affluent here than they would have been in their homeland of Ireland. Right. But those were good years in Ireland. Oh yeah, they were, they were very simple years. I didn't know the four of us, um, and my mother slept in one bedroom. We, I didn't know what wealth or poverty or anything of that was. It was just beyond my vision. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it. I had a grandmother who wore long black skirts and dresses, and we had a dog. What's and, the name uh, of the dog? Fowler. Fowler? Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. That's a good name. In Ireland? Mm -hmm, in Ireland. Did you leave him in Ireland? Did you bring him he back? He wasn't to mine, he was Granny's. No. There you go. So, you know, we, we just had the pleasure of having him when we had cats. It was nice. Now, my other question is when you moved to Rittenhouse yourself into this parish, what mm -hmm. was your first impression? It's like you're finally here, you'd always love visiting here. I just loved it because, um, 
I had known it since I was a child. Had you gone to church here as a child, some? Oh, absolutely. So what's the, what would, like you grew up at Blessed Sacrament Parish, West Philly, what would be the difference in St. Patrick's? Not that it's better, but just. Well, the difference would have been that most Blessed Sacrament had hundreds and hundreds of children. And it was a, more of a blue collar neighborhood, this neighborhood when I would come down to St. Patrick's. I wish I could remember the priest's name, but anyhow. Monsignor Vallely, maybe. Yeah. yeah. How did you know that? Well, I've read the history. And um, we would come here to mass, and uh, I spent a lot of nights staying overnight at my Aunt Mary's, and she took me everywhere, Freeman's, Wanamaker's, Gimbel's, wherever, and I learned the business district of Center City as a child. And I loved this neighborhood. Now, my other question is, when you moved to Rittenhouse yourself into this parish, what mm -hmm. was your first impressions? Like, you're finally here, you'd always love visiting here. I just loved it because um, I had known it since I was a child. Had you gone to church here as a child, some? Oh, absolutely. So what's the, what would, like, you grew up at Blessed Sacrament Parish, West Philly, what would be the difference in, St. Patrick's. Not that it's better, but just... Well, the difference would have been that most Blessed Sacrament had hundreds and hundreds of children. And it was a, more of a blue-collar neighborhood. This neighborhood, when I would come down to St. Patrick's. I wish I could remember the priest's name. But anyhow... Monsignor Vallely, maybe. Yeah. yeah. How did you know that? Well, I've read the history. And uh, we would come here to Mass, and uh, I spent a lot of nights staying overnight at my Aunt Mary's, and she took me everywhere, Freeman's, Wanamaker's, Gimbel's, wherever. And I learned the business district of Center City as a child. And I loved this neighborhood. What, what do you think of when you first think of St. Patrick's? I mean, obviously you've been here a long time. Like if somebody had never been here, they're going to say, what's your church like at home? I would say it's wonderful. It's very um, quiet and peaceful and everyone's welcome. Um, it's down to earth. It's very nice. It's warm, friendly. And all the priests that have ever been here that I knew were all been very nice. Yeah. And very caring and loving. I mean, it's not... When I was very young, I thought it was a little uppity, but as I grew up and I got to know so many of the priests and the parishioners, and my Aunt Mary knew a lot of people in the parish, and my mother knew people in the parish. So you... you you kind of saw it as balanced out. Mm -hmm. People are very good people. Yep. Yeah. But you would say with all the, so over 40 years, the parish has changed a lot. It's become, you said, less Irish families, more diverse. Mm -hmm. It's just the neighborhood changing? Oh yeah, the whole, everything's changed. Yeah. And most of the businesses on 20th Street here were probably Jewish owned. Hmm. And now they're just other locals. Right. It's local. It's much more diversified. Was there a time when the neighborhood, was, I heard in the 70s or the 80s, there was a time when things had kind of emptied out some. It was... Well, when I first came downtown, there were more families further south hmm. and west. But I think a lot of people have left the city, but there's a younger generation. There's a more um, social, you know. Moving more, back. Pardon? It's probably gotten a little rowdier. In the yes. It's much, it, it, it has. For better or for worse? <laughs> uh, Who can well, say? Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 to me, it's... I think when you grow up in a place, you develop 
thoughts and feelings about a parish when you're young, and you don't lo lo lose them. You kind of carry them because they have history in there. Mm. You know. So in some ways, you still feel about St. Patrick's that you always have. In some ways, but I think it's much more diversified now. Mm. Final statements. Nice place. It's wonderful. All right. It's. I think it's wonderful, and I think. What would be two favorite favorite spot in the chapel? Favorite sh statue? Favorite shrine? The Infant of Prague, over in the lower church. You prefer upper chapel. or lower church for mass? Lower. Lower why? It's cozier. It's more intimate. That's the Irish in you. Yeah. You grew up in a cottage. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Well, thank you. This is great. Okay. That's, we have one more video, too. Um, I thought it was really beautiful what Rosemary said, is that when you grow up as a child in a parish, even though things changed, you carry those childhood feelings about your parish with you, and those never quite go away. I thought that was really profound, and um, I was moved. So I want to present the last presenter, uh, just for another, what, seven, eight minutes. Timmy McSorley lives down on... Uh, now Dane and 20 something. Yeah, you know McSorley? Yeah. You guys heard of the guy? I think so. <laughs> yeah, we heard him. Well, he's okay, right? What is he known for? He walks all over the neighborhoods. He's known as the walker or something, you know. He's a note taker. <laughs> he's a note taker. He's a note taker. There you go. So I sat down with Timmy uh, for this, for, for researching all of this history and, and, uh, I, I, I sat outside with him the other day and he gave, I think, another great interview. One of my favorite people, and I apologize for the volume levels. I know it could be boosted, but it takes all kind of technology that's beyond me. So we've done our best. We're still struggling, but we're getting some good stuff. And here's Timmy, and then we'll just kind of open the floor for some comments, questions, et cetera. Here's Tim McSorley, and he, he just, he just uh, was widowed uh, his wife Cass died. I did the uh, the funeral. It was sad, but he's holding together. Here he is. What two days ago or something? Right. First question is this: How does it feel to be the face of the parish? How does it feel to be what? The face of the parish. What do you mean by that? You. Me. <laughs> I don't do Uh, you've been here how many years? How many years old? Eighty-eight. How's it feel? Great, humble, right? I mean, I got a little problem for a while. First question is this: How does it feel to be the face of the parish? How does it feel to be what? The face of the parish. What do you mean by that? That's you. Me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand that. I'm not the face. <laughs> I was just, I was just messing with you. No. So you've been here how many years? How many years old? Eighty-eight. How's it feel? Great. I'm all right. I mean, I got a little problem some, once in a while. Had a, a congestion problem, but that was such clear. So you're bap so. baptized, married, everything, school at St. Patrick's? Yeah. I, oh. I may have been baptized at St. Gabriel. Okay. Uh, what was what was the school like? Just give us a hint. You were there. Well, it was uh, the Monsignor Valley was the uh, It was strict. I mean, uh, they had their rules and regulations, but everybody got along, right? Yeah. It was a, it wasn't a big school, I bet. But uh, you had to go to uh, mass as well, children's mass or something. Yeah, twice, two times, eh? Nine and eleven. Why I was both? an older boy, choir boy, and they made you go to two masses every weekend. Every week, on the holidays. Wow. Another question: How long have you lived in? You live in this neighborhood your whole life. All my life. What was it like, uh, kids? I may have moved. We moved one time when I was real small, but we came back again. Kids from Schuylkill. What was it like growing up here? I mean, was it you just run around, do what you want? Yeah. Well, you was no not supervised like you see the parents today are really strict with their kids. You keep them in and all that. We were out in the morning and out of back. I'd be back at dinner time and be in at a certain time and all that, but. Yeah. Nobody was really hounding you. And, and Cass, your wife, who passed away this last year, how did you two meet? Because you were both growing up. My wife lived in my mother's house. 
she or she was a, she had a dysfunctional family mm. and my sisters were friendly with her and she had no place to go and they brought her in there wow. that's how I met her so she moved in she moved in there you go Earl, she, Cass was a she was also in a home Huh. Saint, Saint Vincent's home. I guess we have the idea that everything was ideal in the past, oh, no. but not the a case. Lot of, a lot of a, her father was an alcoholic. Yeah. But so, we took him in and straightened him out. <laughs> now you were how old? So getting married to St. Patrick's, Cass comes down the aisle. Who was the priest? I think it was Father King. Father King. Were you nervous? Was I nervous? Oh, yeah. With all them people. <laughs> Yeah. Good day, though, your wedding day. Oh, yeah. And then your daughter was baptized at St. Patrick's, too. Yeah. Where was that, in the lower church? Uh, yeah, I imagine. I guess they'd always do baptisms They did in the a lower. baptism in the lower church. Yeah. The font was different. It was on the wall, against the wall. Yeah, they moved it since, you know. That's something. Yeah. And then we did the funeral there, too. That was in the lower church, That right? was in the lower church. So married in the upper, baptism in the lower, funeral in the lower. Father Faye blessed our 25th anniversary, mm. and Father Mackle did our 50th. Wow. And I just come over to drink beer. <laughs> you buried her. <laughs> I did bury her. That's true. I was just trying to be lighthearted. The, the Fosters told me you talked to them. Yeah. I love just a quick memory from your wife's burial. I love it was raining so hard at the yeah, graveside. They're, they're really Who was that? People that had the big umbrellas. Uh, Billy Shellock. Yeah. His wife's a. Uh, they had that huge neon beach umbrella. Yeah, they he, had me come well, under. He lives out of shore. He had it in his stroke. Well, he was proud of that. He's like oh, in, yeah. in the smart as he's smoking a cigarette. His wife's a Rafferty. Okay. Yeah, they're great. Uh, you were how old in World War Two? You're. 12, 13, 14. So junior high. Yeah. You, what were those years? Because everything changed in the <clears throat> war. Yeah. Well, it was tough. I mean, uh, we had three kids. My mother worked sometimes. She had a part-time job. And uh, you got a compensation from the government, which was never enough. Yeah. I mean, for board and Where food. did she work? She worked in the... It was a radio factory on 25th and Locust. It's an apartment house now. Your dad was drafted? He, no, he enlisted. Okay. There was no work in Philadelphia. Construction work died. Huh. And either you worked in the Navy Yard or you went somewhere else. And the Navy Yard only took so many people. How long was he gone for? Two and a half years. A year. You heard from him how often? Well, my, well, my mother heard from a, you know, mail. They were, how were they praying? You're saying they were praying for all the troops, too. Well, St. Pat's had something every week, and they had a big poster of the registered. All the guys who were in the service. Yeah. People were wounded, and people were dead, and they, they were all in the back of the church. What about you kids left behind? Were you? Did you feel the pressure of the war, or was it still just childhood? Well, we never knew we were poor, let's put it that way. <laughs> because there was no money, and nobody had any money. So you didn't so, notice? It didn't. Not really. Until you got to high school. Right? With mom's working, did culture change for you all? Kids kind of off on their own? Well, she was. She had a job right here at 20... Okay. On, on the Lombard Street, where that building is now. Yeah. It used to be Pembroke Milk. Hmm. She worked there. So after two and a half years, war's over. Was there big relief? Oh, yeah, sure. Everybody was out, you know, celebrating. Block parties, all that stuff. All that, yeah. What do they do at block parties? They had uh, amusements and uh, games of chance, and they collected money and uh, they give it to the parish or it was St. Anthony's or St. Pat's yeah. or the, the American Legion or whatever. Yeah. American Legion ran most of it. You said too something about how your dad. How, what was it like when he finally came home? He just was that just happened one day. He just walked in and said, "I'm back," and that was it. Morning. Lived on Waverly Street, twenty six. Morning, night, what time of day? It was about in the afternoon. Right? Yeah. And he just walked home? Yep. Well, I, I don't know. We came from Fort Kilmer or Fort Dix. I don't know where he came from. What did he do once he got home? Well, he was off for a while, but things, there was no no work around. Mm. Construction didn't start. Everybody got home at 46 or 47, and the construction back didn't pick up until 50s or 51. Yeah. So uh, when everything was converted back into 
peacetime. Right. He worked as a truck driver. He worked for Warner Concrete. Different. You eventually, you said you had known John McShane, I mean, at least at oh, a I distance. Worked for him. You worked for him. Yeah, I didn't know him personally. I mean, we talked and, you know, and he asked me one day what, what I was doing up St. Pat's. What did you say? I said the same thing you are, going to church. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's he, waiting for a chauffeur to pick him up. He had seen you. I, I had a, I used to wear a nail bag and I was a foreman out of the job out in West Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania, and had star on it. When we went to the meetings, he said Star. Hmm. That's what he called me, Star, because they had the nail back. So he he lived in the Barclay. What did he get picked up by a chauffeur driving a car or what? He was in a Barclay. No, he oh, he he lived in the Barclay. Oh, in the Barclay, yeah, but he had a guy picking him up. That's only a half a block away. How did he, what he, was he, he like personality-wise? Well, dressed nice. Dressed nice? Oh, yeah, he was mean. Mean to his brother, I knew that. His brother was a laborer. And he, he was walking a job with WFIL, the City Line Avenue. He was working there and it was 100 and some degrees out there. And I heard him say to the superintendent, what's Charlie doing? If he's going to play around out there, send him the hell home. Huh. <laughs> he's tough. Were people in general tougher back then, you think, than today? Or just but depends? I think he was very generous. I think he had a very good, I mean, he was very charitable. I know he had a lot of yeah. charity. Yeah. He named it. Right. He gave, St. Pat's, he gave a lot to them. What would you say makes St. Is St. Pat's, what you say, is different from other parishes? What do you think is distinctive no, in the I city? I think they're all alike. Everybody loved their parish. Yeah. When you when you met somebody, you say, what, they wouldn't ask you where you live. They said, what parish you're from. Yeah. And that's the way it was. Just how it goes. Like at St. Gabe's or St. Richard's or whatever. What, what kind of hat is that? You oh, were. this is a fishing hat. I had fishing hat. I was in there scraping in the, the paper and the stuff. I put that on the. What are you drinking okay. there? <laughs> What's that you're drinking? What am I drinking? Yingling lager. Yingling lager, yeah. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Hey, that's the people we have prepared. So I want to do this. I'm going to stop the screen share here and just kind of open this to anybody. Um, you had said too. So, Pat Henningsen, you grew up here as well. I don't know if. We haven't talked one-on-one, -on -one. maybe we need to. Um, are you still with us? Not That's even... Stuart, Father. What's that? Who, who are you talking to? Uh, Pat Henningsen. I think oh, I okay. can hear, but I don't know if she's unmuted. So you gotta unmute yourself. You just click on that. I'm not, yeah, now I'm unmuted, yes. Pat, did, did fill no. us in on you. Well, let's see. My mother's family was here since the 1860s. Holy smokes. My Why haven't we spoken? My family was here since the 18, late 1880s, maybe. What are you doing uh, this week? Let's talk. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what's, what's been your, what, let me ask you one specific question. What are the stories they told you, your, your, your parents? Um, I know my um, mother's family, the Tolans, um, ran a boarding house where the um, young couples who came from far away to get married in St. Patrick's would stay at their boarding house because I think St. Patrick's Parish went down to like Cape May. Wow. So they, so they, right, they did go there and so they would have a house where people could stay at. Yeah, back. they did. They had a boarding house. They would stay there. Yeah. Wow. Um, what else do you remember from the past? What comes to mind? Me, I was, I was uh, baptized, first communion. I was married. I mean, everything, everything was St. Patrick's. St. Patrick's all the time. Yeah, that's great. Um, anything else you remember from its history? What what came to mind while we were speaking that you want to share? Um, I don't know. You know, I really couldn't hear what anybody was saying. Yeah, it that's was my fault. Yep. So, um, and I would have, I would have liked to hear um, Glenn or Oogie Johnson, um, because he was at my very best friend and he was her younger cousin. Oh, really? So he was like, he was like the kid who would bother us all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's connect to anybody else, uh, anything come to mind, anything fun, any other memories or any other questions from the young, this is as much for the older parishioners as it is for the young kids. 
if they have any general questions. Let's just see what happens. Maybe not. What's young? What's young? That's a good question. <laughs> ask Nancy. Grace has asked Nancy about the 1839 baptism. Wrong date, but sometime within the first seven years. Uh, Nancy, do you have anything about an 18 something baptism? Oh, uh, yes. Um, yeah, my great grandfather in 1846 was baptized at St. Patrick's. I believe it was his two parents that were the first generation that arrived here from Ireland, settled in this area, and each of their children were baptized. And then ever since then, just one baptism after another, every generation down to me. Wow. So you're the very first generation, basically. Yeah, at the moment. Yep. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, the house that I live in was purchased by my great grandparents when they got married in 1887. You still live in that house? I still live in this house. We've had many a viewing of deceased relatives here in the dining room. There you go. So you know that. Yep. We've had I know it well. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, too? Uh, we're about to wrap up, but any other thoughts or comments on just stories that you've heard of about Philadelphia, about the Archdiocese at large? I know there's other people like Chris, Jim, Christine, others. It could be anything about just church memories or of this parish, even more recently. Yeah. Unless you're I'm curious, afraid to... I'm curious uh, as a newcomer to the parish, what are some of the traditions that have, have gone away that you wish were back again? Like what were some of the, you know, I, I think as the neighborhood changes, the traditions change, um, but what are the one or two things tradition wise that you wish that we still had? It seems- Midnight like Mass Christmas. Midnight Mass at Christmas, says Jimmy Stewart. You want yeah. it back right now? <laughs> if possible, yes. All right. Well, the pastor heard you, and I see him smiling. That's uh, good. Uh, on, um, St. Patrick's, on St. Patrick's Day, we always had a mass, and it's quite different from the parade mass. The parade mass was um, at more uh, actual people from Ireland. Uh, on St. Patrick's Day, we always had, the bishop always came to St. Patrick's on St. Patrick's Day, and there was a mass. And we had, uh, we were taught by St. Joseph's nuns. So we were lucky we got St. Patrick's Day off. And then we, two days later, we got St. Joseph's Day off. So that was, that was very happy. Uh, March was very happy for us, that those days. I'm off school. Yeah, right. And, it, and at the actual, the St. Patrick's Day Mass, that's when we always sang Great and Glorious St. Patrick. Yeah, I don't know when the last time we've sung that at this church. Go back with that one. You want it back, Jim? I'd like to bring that back. I like that, yeah. Great and Glorious St. Patrick on St. Patrick's Day, yes. How does it go, Jim? Can you sing and dance for us for a moment? Uh, <laughs> my wife said, she's got my, she got tape. She's got, uh, yeah, Great and Glorious St. Patrick, pray for our dear country, the country of our fathers. Great and Glorious St. Patrick. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> <laughs> you like, like uh, Pavarotti over there. It's beautiful. Um, all right, we could consider that hymn, Midnight Mass. We're getting, we're getting some ideas. Um, also, too, anybody that discovers history, please let us know. If anybody has other people I should talk to. I'm, I'm actually in the middle of a process. I still have four or five people I still need to get together with and meet with some of the parishioners of, the, of, of days of yore. So um, I'm still in process while we present this, which is exciting. It doesn't, not just admitting it's incomplete. Um, yeah, it's exciting. So, well, so Father Tim, tell me how you got so interested in the history, and are are you always a history buff? Because I was in quarantine, and I found some boxes in the basement. <laughs> That's how, and I started digging through things, and I discovered that the floor that my feet were resting on was from 1860, and that kind of shocked me. And it all began the process of. Um, once you read a little bit of a parish, and I think what Tim McSorley said is right, is that, you know, this is, 
people's parish, but everybody loves their parish. And some of it's so practical is that because I'm here, because I'm living here every day serving here, it just started to matter a lot more. And when I, when we had the resources sitting in the house and I had time, it was, it just, it felt a, like a responsibility and B it got more exciting as you read, because um, you're not going to read 181 years of history and be bored. It's, um, um, yeah, it's been fascinating and fun. Yeah. So Thank you. We're going to keep going. Another thing too, we're going to, Father Hyacinth and I are talking about um, starting not only a better sort of video, a parish history video, which is better quality than my, my bad audio and all these things, but we're also maybe a display, maybe in the parish hall, like large sort of boards with a display that kind of tell the history, visuals and stuff. So maybe publishing a book again. So there's, a, there's, it's not just ending here. It's um, something that's just begun to be presented. And because it's amazing, because this parish is still amazing, and it was, and uh, that's why we want to revive a sense of history, because the history keeps going. Um, if I could just chime in. I want to um, acknowledge Father Tim and all his work, and on behalf of everyone, just say thank you for all of this. It's really a tremendous amount of work, and it, it helps us all to appreciate the history which helps us to appreciate the parish more. And of course, lots of people have come and gone through the years, but all of us have a part to play, however long we're here. And we're all part of the you know, next chapter in the story. And in the end, of course, it's all about what God is doing in and through us. And hopefully we can be faithful instruments of that. But, uh, but thank you very much, Father Tim, for organizing all this. It's really tremendous. Definitely. Um, I second that motion. You say yeah, them. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. All right. The mute claps. There we go. Well, let's take our hands from clapping to prayer, and we'll just do that to send us off. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Um, we'll keep it very simple. St. Patrick, you are the patron of this parish. Watch over and intercede for anyone who was born here, baptized here, anyone who's attended Mass here. Watch over us presently. Pray for us. And, and just as we say, to, we'll just pray to the main saints, the response we pray for us. We, so we say, first, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. Patrick, pray for us. St. Dominic and all the saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, Pat Henningsen, maybe hang on the line, because I'd like to get your contact info. Anybody else, before logging off, if, if you have... Uh, people to connect me to or if you want to connect hang on the line too but we're going to kind of close it down and it, it, it keeps going forward so it's um it's all beautiful thanks everybody